As bridges go, the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama couldn't appear more unremarkable. Spanning the Alabama River at just over 100 yards, it takes mere seconds to cross by car. And yet, this is a remarkable bridge. For in early 1965, in the midst of the civil rights movement, this bridge spanned two worlds, the world of what was and the world of what could be. Crossing it meant freedom, equality, and even death to some. Jimmy Lee Jackson never even made it to the bridge, but his death at the hands of a state trooper inspired a march that would begin there. Reverend James Reed crossed the bridge but was turned back and later beaten to death by a white supremacist. Viola Liuzzo also crossed it, but afterward was murdered by the Klan. This was the cost of freedom. We always determined that freedom was more valuable than life. The dignity was more important than a comfort zone. And when you're on that frequency, then graveyards cannot contain such an idea. In January 1965, the focus of the civil rights movement was no longer segregation. The previous campaigns had achieved the goal of making segregation illegal. The new campaign would be a fight for congressionally guaranteed voting rights. The battle would begin in Selma. Blacks had no guarantee for the right to vote in local and state elections. Despite the passage of the 15th Amendment, 100 years earlier, which prohibited racial discrimination in voting, there was little chance that Southern blacks could exercise their right to vote if whites didn't want them to. There were too many restrictions, such as poll taxes and difficult civics tests inflicted upon blacks who tried to register. The right to vote is so fundamental in democracy. So Selma was a campaign about something very fundamental that occurred at a time when the movement had a very high profile. Jimmy Lee Jackson was a young black activist from Alabama who got involved with the movement to attain voting rights. But his life would be cut short. On February 18th at a demonstration in Marion, Alabama, Jimmy saw his grandfather being beaten and he pushed his way into the fray to protect him. He was shot in the stomach by a state trooper, an Alabama state trooper. Jimmy was taken to the hospital in Selma, 35 miles away, because the hospital in Marion, where he worked as an orderly, refused to treat him. I know that there could have been something done for him, and it would have made me feel a lot better if they had tried to do something for his wound uh, before bringing him to Selma. Jimmy died eight days later. The identity of the trooper who shot him was kept secret. No charges were ever filed. At one of two services for Jackson, Martin Luther King told the gathered crowd of 2,000 that Jackson's death must not be in vain. The innocent blood of this fine servant of God may well serve as the redemptive force. Yes, sir. That will bring new light to this dark state. Civil rights leaders used Jackson's death as a rallying cry. And out of that came the decision we need to march to Montgomery and bring our cause, walk 50 miles if necessary, uh, to bring the symbolic body of Jimmy Lee Jackson to the governor's mansion uh, and insist upon the right to vote. The road to Alabama's capital would begin with a journey out of Selma across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. It would not be an easy crossing. As plans for the march were set, Alabama Governor George Wallace, an ardent segregationist, issued an order that the marchers not be allowed to leave Selma. As these events unfolded, Reverend James Reed, a 38-year-old white Unitarian minister in Washington, D.C., paid careful attention. A fervent supporter of the civil rights movement, 
He read and watched the news surrounding Jackson's death. He was deeply moved. On March 7th of 1965, Reverend Reeb watched news reports of the march. He was horrified by what he saw. The brutality that ensued came to be known as Bloody Sunday. John Lewis was there. I can still hear the moans the groans and people crying out for help as they were being trampled by horses and the tear gas was burning in the eyes. I was hit in the head while I stayed true with a nightstick and I felt like this was the last demonstration for me. To this day, I don't know how I made it back across that bridge, back through the streets of Selma, back to the little church that we had left from. Governor Wallace's troopers had beaten the men and women who marched, but they hadn't beaten the movement. It gave the whole sympathy of the nation to those people who bowed their heads and took the blows. That really marked the, 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 the civil rights movement coming of age. The next day, when Martin Luther King urged ministers throughout America to participate in the Selma campaign, Reverend James Reed was ready to take a stand. He packed his bags for Selma. On March 9th, Reverend Reeb and 2,000 others prepared for a second attempt at marching from Selma to Montgomery. But in light of the previous violence, federal judge Frank Johnson ordered the march postponed. King did not want to disobey a federal order and complied partially. The marchers crossed the bridge where they were again met by troopers. They then kneeled and a prayer was said. The marchers turned back and dispersed. That evening, after meeting with Dr. King, the marchers left Brown Chapel and dispersed for dinner. Leaving the restaurant, we went, turned to the right because it was a shorter distance back to the church. So we walked down here, this uh, short distance toward the end of the block, and it was just about here that we noticed that three white men were coming at us from across the street, and they were shouting at us. Uh, they, in fact, shouted, hey, you niggers. All three of us were white, but they used that uh, epithet. And w they came up behind us. I was standing nearest the wall here, and Jim Reeb was nearest the curb, and they came up behind us, and one of them carried this club and swung it and hit Jim on the side of the head here, just above the ear. And uh, we fell to the, Jim fell to the ground. Reeve suffered a massive skull fracture and a blood clot. I remember vividly his holding my hand and squeezing it tighter and tighter from the pain, apparently. Uh, he was not able to speak, but he just, he was holding my hand and then, and then he went unconscious. Reeve's friends took him to the hospital. Two days later, he died. Three days after that, on March 15, 1965, President Johnson addressed a joint session of Congress and presented his proposal for a Voting Rights Act. He memorialized Reverend Reed and stunned much of America when he infused his speech with the sacred rallying cry of the Civil Rights Movement. Because it's not just Negroes, but really, it's all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. I was sitting next to Dr. King when Lyndon Johnson said, and we shall overcome. And tears came down his face. He cried and said, we will make it from Selma to Montgomery. And the Voting Rights, the voting rights Act will be passed. As for justice, there was none. Three men were picked up and charged with Reeves' murder. But the outcome was a familiar refrain. An all-white jury found them not guilty. Nonetheless, like the deaths of the martyrs before him, Reeves' murder would not be forgotten. I think it affected the people in the South. I think Christian people looked at a minister being beaten to death 
and thought, this may not be Christian what people are doing against these black people. I think it started, uh, planted some seeds of, uh, of, of fairness.